Um, it is August 17th, 2022, and I am here with Bruce Horn. I am Hanson Sue. Um, so to begin with, um, let's start with where and when you were born. So I was born in Torrance, California. That was in uh, 1959, about uh, 63 years ago tomorrow. So um, I'm getting up there. Kind of feel like a bit of the old guard now. <laughs> And did you grow up there? No, uh, I grew up in Palo Alto, oh. and uh, my parents had moved to, uh, they met at Stanford, and um, I grew up in and around Palo Alto, moving to Ladera and then at Palo Alto proper uh, for basically uh, junior high school and high school. So I went to Terman Junior High School and Gunn High School. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so were your parents um, like graduate students at Stanford? Or? They were undergraduates. Um, my mom went to Stanford when she was 16. Uh, she had grown up uh, as a teenager in Hawaii and, and left to go to Stanford and she met my dad at Stanford and he was a football player and you know she was just one of these really smart young people and they they met at Stanford as uh, they, I guess they were uh, they worked together in the um, cafeteria I guess and so that's how they met. Oh well, that's a fun, fun story. Yeah. <coughs> So um, what, what did your parents do? Uh, my mom, uh, I think my mom had an IQ of about 200, but you know, she had kids and at that time, you know, uh, people were, had limited options and so she raised the four of us and my dad was a pediatrician at the Menlo Medical Clinic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have three siblings. I've got an older brother and uh, an older sister and a younger sister. Oh, cool. Um, what were your interests or hobbies or favorite subjects as a child? Oh, as a child? Um, well, um, I just, I've always been kind of an environmentalist, an outdoor person, you know, hiking, cycling, and so on. I have always been interested in airplanes and flying um, and math, of course. And uh, one of the things that was lucky for me, of course, growing up in Palo Alto is being in proximity of Hewlett Packard. And uh, we happened to know somebody who was at uh, Hewlett Packard and could buy me HP calculators as they came out at HP prices. I remember I bought my very first one after working for an entire summer uh, to save $395 to buy an HP 45 calculator at the Stanford bookstore. And I remember going in with my pile of money to the Stanford bookstore and buying this calculator. And that was the most amazing event. And I would just sit and play with it for hours and hours and hours. And I still remember the feel of it and what it smelled like because it was such an event to have your own little personal computing device in your hand. So that was, you know, kind of, I was a math kid and, a, and you know, an outdoor kid at the same time. Interesting. So <coughs> you came to, so the, your interest in the, in the calculator was more from a math perspective rather than from a, like a electronics perspective? Yeah, it was just what it could do, you know, kind of the, the fact that you could actually do all of these mathematical functions in a little thing in your hand. I wasn't drawn to the electronics part of it or the, even the hardware design. I was drawn to the software of it, the thing that it could do, the, the features and the functionality, um, which I thought was, thought was pretty mi miraculous, actually. Yeah. So was that your first introduction to computing, or were there others? Well, before that, actually, um, when I was in sixth grade, Nils Nilsson, who was the head of the Stanford Computer Science Department, brought a terminal, a teletype terminal, to Ladera Elementary School to show the kids what computing was. And so he would dial up to SRI and, and show us, you know, basic and other programming languages and things that you could do. And that was really the thing that kicked me off into computing was that Nils uh, showed us what was possible. And, you know, later on when I was, you know, a teenager and I had money and I could make money and bought the calculator, that's when I did that. But earlier on, I, I was able to kind of get influenced by Nils, who was an amazing person, by the way, just a tremendous human. Um, and, uh, and that kind of got me aware of the computing world and what was possible. A little bit later, I think it must have been in um, junior high school, I met um, um, somebody who, another, another kid, and I've forgotten his name, Greg, Anyway, Greg had connections at Stanford, and we would go over to Ventura Hall, where they had IMLACs, which were little vector terminals. And you could play with those, and had the, they had Play-Doh terminals for, for you know, learning 
um, all sorts of subjects, and it was it was kind of a play space that they just allowed kids to wander in and, and use these terminals if they weren't being used. So that gave me another opportunity to get into that. And that was a little bit before I was uh, invited to come up to Xerox Park. Yeah. So you mentioned Nils Nilsson. <clears throat> Did you have any other mentors or teachers that were influential? Oh, absolutely. You know, in, at, um, at Gunn, and you know, I had teachers all along who kind of supported me and, and recognized that I was kind of into math. And I remember when we moved from uh, Ladera to Palo Alto and I went into Terman, they, they did some sort of math assessment. And I had been doing some algebra in sixth grade because the teacher recognized that I needed more stuff to do. So I kind of, kind of placed out of what was gonna actually happen in seventh grade. And so I got to do a lot more interesting things. Um, and then, of course, I had a math professor, I call him a professor, but he was a high school teacher, uh, Hawkinson, who was just tremendous and also um, opened my eyes to a lot of what was possible in the, in the math world. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Um, it, it sounds like you had a lot of freedom to explore all of these interests and, and go to Stanford and do all these things. Were, were your parents really supportive of, of all your interests? They were supportive. I, I think mostly they didn't really know what was going on. I mean, they just saw that I would leave and come back, and I'd tell them what would happen. They'd say, that sounds great, you know, and, and they, they didn't really, that wasn't their interest, right? They were not interested in, in computers or any of those things. My dad, being a pediatrician, and he worked really hard, and, you know, my mom was, was busy doing her things. So uh, it was more or less I was the third child, so I kind of was... I had the freedom just because it, there was too much other stuff going on, you know, managing the other kids. I just could do whatever I wanted. It was very nice. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, so, uh, so let's get to Park. So how, how did that whole thing happen? How were you first invited to go to, go to Park? So I don't exactly remember, but in, in, I think it was in junior high school. Maybe it was in high school. I think I was 13 or 14. And... Um, I think it was Hawkinson, maybe it was another teacher, who introduced me to Ted Kaler, who was in the learning research group at Park. And he, Ted had come down and said, I need some kids to work on some things at Park. And so uh, I ended up being able to go along with Steve Putz, who was my best friend. And we, we just got integrated into, into the learning research group. Um, you know, they'd had a bunch of kids working on small talk as kind of a part of this project, but but I guess Steve was kind of an electronics genius, and I was kind of into computer software, so we just got to do whatever we wanted. Um, it was kind of apart from the from the you know kids interaction from small talk, right? Yeah. So that was really interesting for me. Yeah, I I, fi I do find that really interesting that um, <coughs> that you that you and Steve. Um, sort of were, were kind of on the side so or, uh, you know, separate from the other stuff that was going on with the other kids. Right. Um, was that just because you were already so advanced or, or? Yeah, maybe that we were a little bit advanced, but we also just showed different interests, you know. So I was really interested in how small talk worked, you know as a little bit less than the small talk system itself, which of course I loved. It's like, well, okay, I love this thing. How does it work? And so I was interested in, you know, the virtual machine and how to work on that and um, kind of lower level stuff. Plus, um, you know, I was there all the time because Park was an easy walk from my house. And so I was there all the time. And so they realized that I could do stuff for them. And so at one point, um, the CSL uh, people decided that I should do the backups for the big um, the time sharing machine we ha had called Maxi, so that would be that was just a task I had, and I went and did the backups and did the tapes and ran the system there. And it was nice to have a have a responsibility, and that you know, as a young teenager, that these genius adults would allow me to do. It just it was just a tremendous experience. I I can't imagine uh, how it changed my life. Just amazing. Yeah, that sounds incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. Um, so, did you have any? any interaction at the time with any of those other kids or were you just completely se se separate from, from I would say completely separate I mean I don't think I ever talked to any of the other kids um, I mean I knew them kind of vaguely because they came from Jordan and other schools but you know 
Steve and I were from, you know, Terman and Gunn, so, and there was nobody else from Terman and Gunn at Park at the time, um, so I, I didn't really interact with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then, it sounds like, <clears throat> um, well, I'm, you know, Adele referred to you as an intern. What, what was your, what was your, for, did you have any formal, like, anything, or you were just sort of around and people would give you stuff to do? I was just sort of around. I had a badge. I think I had a badge. I'd sign in like an employee, but they didn't pay me. Um, so I, I have no idea what my actual arrangement was with Xerox Corporation. Although at one point, you know, I was working really hard on, I think it was on the note taker, or maybe I was working on a Dorado or something, and a, and a graduate student had come in, and I got to know this graduate student, and I found out that he was getting paid. And I remember thinking, man, I should get paid too. So I went to Adele and I said, hey Adele, I, I kind of, I'm doing a bunch of work as much as that guy, the grad student, and I'm 16, you know, I'd like to get paid. She goes, oh, okay, we'll, we'll make that happen. And so, you know, basically the next week I started getting a paycheck. So that was, that was pretty amazing. It was my first salaried paycheck it was from Xerox Park and Adele made that happen. Because wow. cause I just asked, I said, hey, this grad student is getting paid, can I get paid? And she said, sure. Wow, okay, Amazing. so then, so that must have initiated some sort of formal, I mean, you had to, you would have had to submit like a W-2 or something, right? I guess, like, boy, that was, I mean, I was just a kid, I don't remember, I just remember getting paid and, and I must have filled out tax forms or something, but, um, you know, it was minimum wage or whatever, but still, as a 16-year-old getting a salary or whatever it was, just amazing. I should say, by the way, when I was 12 years old, um, I decided I wanted to go work at Hewlett Packard. And I wrote a letter to Hewlett Packard asking for a job when I was 12. And I got a beautiful letter back. I wish I still had it. It said, thank you for your interest in Hewlett Packard. It's our policy not to hire anybody under the age of 18. Um, we appreciate your interest. Please let us know when you've turned 18 and we'll, we'll uh, talk about employment at that point. And so I thought, what a great letter. And, uh, and the joke is, well, you know, uh, Xerox Park didn't have any problem with child labor, uh, whereas maybe HP did. Um, but I, I, just, I just thought, A, first of all, I loved Hewlett Packard for what they were doing and how they treated me as a young person. And then, of course, Park and Xerox and all the people at Park, you know, treated me like an actual asset and gave me things to do and, and even paid me. Amazing. Yeah. So you, you don't remember what your formal title was even? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had a title. Yeah. You know. Okay, so, so you, you, you started at Park in 1974? I think that's about right. I think I might have been 14. Okay, so I, uh, you were at 14 at that age. Um, <clears throat> uh, can you remember your first meeting with Alan Kay? Well, the first person I actually met when I came to Park was Steve Weyer. Oh, really? And um, see, even though Ted Kaler had come to, to Terman or Gunn, I can't remember at the time, to you know, kind of recruit some kids, he was actually still off at Carnegie Mellon, I believe. Um, and so Steve Weyer happened to be around, and so I met Steve, and, and he was the first person I met. And kind of, you know, as a young person, you, just, you have a very narrow view of the world, and you kind of go, this is the guy, right? This is Steve, and he, he was super supportive and helpful, and he's still a friend to this day. And uh, I remember meeting Alan kind of peripherally and, and kind of getting the idea that, oh, this is the guy who's, you know, the head of LRG, and that's pretty interesting, you know? And, I don't really remember talking to him much other than he was super supportive and we didn't talk uh, very deeply into, about anything because I was being managed kind of by Steve Weyer. Um, but you know, of course, later I got to know Alan pretty well and, and we would play tennis and um, you know, I consider him a huge influence on my, on my future career, of course, as well as Steve and Ted and many other people uh, in the learning research group, you know, Dave Robson, Dan Ingalls, of course. Yeah, could, could you talk more about like um, working with, with them and your relationship with, with the other members? Um, I'm pretty sure that they kind of just let me do what I wanted to do. So I would come in and you know maybe I had, was working on Maxi, I was doing backups or something, and Ted every once in a while would, 
would say, hey, maybe you should look into this, or Steve would do that, and I would just do whatever I wanted. Um, what was interesting is at that age, you know, at 16 or 15, I had an office with a door and a window and 12 disc packs uh, on the floor that was my office, even though maybe I wasn't even getting paid at that point, but they gave me an office. And my kind of ongoing joke is that, you know, uh, until like two months ago, um, my office was my backpack and I would, you know, work off my laptop and I've, it was downhill ever since, right? But, uh, but Park treated me like a real member of the, of the group and I would have things to do every once in a while. I, you know, I did some small projects and small talk. I did a little flight simulator kind of concept that um, Ted helped me think about and how would I do that. And I got a, um, a tape, or Ted had gotten a tape of you know, kind of a topographical map of um, western Nevada. Uh, you know, basically points in a grid, which were heights, and I would, you know, Ted explained how I might do some sort of perspective, and I built a little thing that would allow you to kind of fly around over this, over this uh, perspective space. It was really fun. But, you know, Ted would give me ideas, Steve would be, give me ideas, and, and mostly they just kind of let me do whatever I wanted. And then when it looked like they needed some kind of work done, like if you think about, you know, the, the Dorado and the note taker, you know, kind of low level stuff. Um, they would just recommend me to do it, and then I would go, and uh, and that would be my project for a, a while. So, for example, um, I worked on the Dorado microcode, and uh, f you know for the, for small talk, yeah, which was a huge project, by the way. Um, and Willie Sue Haugland was my Microsoft or microcode mentor. We'll call her that. Um, so she kind of helped teach me how to do that, and I spent many, many, many days and nights working on the microcode. Uh, actually in a very small room uh, with shooting headphones on because the Dorado was so noisy. I would sit there with the Dorado and the Alto next to it that would, I'd use to debug it and uh, I'd work away and, and write the microcode for Smalltalk. And eventually that got, that started functioning and working and, and that was the system that was demoed to Steve Jobs later. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Oh okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, let, let me go back to some of these other programs. So. You mentioned the flight simulator program. Was that just something that you just came up with on your own completely, or? I think Ted came up with it. Okay. I would, I would, I would think Ted knew that I was interested in flying. He had somehow gotten this data, you know, this topographical map data, and he, I think he just said, "Hey, this would be a good thing to do." And he, he, you know, we worked on it together, and I learned a lot from Ted about kind of how to think about systems. You know, how do you, how would you build such a thing? and how would you do the controls and so on, and how would you do the display. You know, it was very rudimentary, um, not what I would do now, of course, um, or even, even a year after that, I would have learned a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but that's kind of the type of thing I did, and that was actually in the Scientific American article, along with the, uh, Steve Putz's um, circuit diagram, which I thought was very cool. Oh, right, yeah, the circuit diagram, so that was Steve Putz's Yeah, yeah that was Steve okay. Putz, yeah. Steve actually knew how to, you know, build electronics. And so, you know, he had a, a motivation to build a tool to help him make it easier. And he did that in small talk. It was, it was super great. Right. So we're, the two of you worked on separate things. You never separate things. collaborated. Okay. No, no, but we hung out all the time. And, you know, he's, he was also a math guy. And, and we just had a great time together. Yeah. And, and then the, there was also the, a musical note capture program? Yeah, that's right. I did that too. Again, rudimentary. Um, it was just one of these things to kind of get to understand the real-time aspects of, of I.O. and so on. So I did that. Um, later, I, I think, um, you know, one of the other, other um, park people did a you know, much more sophisticated, sophisticated one, one that was actually understood music, because I wasn't a musician. Um, but it did function kind of vaguely, you know, it could figure out what the note was and figure out, you know, the duration of the note and things like that. But it didn't know how to do the notation the way a real musician would lay out notation. And that happened later by an actual musician. So, yeah. And, and so both of these programs were, uh, were demoed and captured on, on videotape. They were, yeah. Yeah. I don't so, remember that, but I, I know I've seen it, I've seen those videos. Right. So the so you don't remember actually them actually recording it or or being part of no it actually because I wasn't the musician that when the music capture program was videoed somebody else was playing the piano playing the keyboard um, I, I knew that it was going on but I didn't I wasn't involved in that oh okay, okay. yeah um, let's see here um, 
we already discussed the Dorado. Um, oh, okay. Let's let's talk about the note takers. How did you how did you get onto that? Good question. Um, I think again, it was just like there was stuff to do and not enough people. And Doug Fairbairn was kind of a friend of the group, obviously, and we were going to put small talk on the note taker. And um, just I ended up getting kind of lent to Doug to help bring the note takers up and, and make sure they continued to work. And there were maybe half a dozen of them and they'd work for a while and then I'd have to figure out what was wrong with them and they'd get fixed and so on. But um, I mostly wrote kind of the, the BIOS, you know, the little operating system underneath that supported Smalltalk, so it supported the Smalltalk um, system. And it had two processors. It had a, an emulation processor that ran Smalltalk and an I.O. processor which did all of the, you know, it did bit blitz over the display and it, it moved the mouse and it watched the keyboard and did sound and so on. We had stereo sound on that, which was really cool. Um, and then these two processors would have to communicate. So I wrote the little interprocess communication uh, package for that and, and, and kind of the supportive software for the system. And I remember, you know, I kind of felt like it was my first portable personal computer um, and it weighed like 50 pounds, but um, it was really fun. <laughs> cool. Um, and uh, so you also worked on a similar Smalltalk 78 environment for a Norwegian computer. I did. Yeah. So that's a slightly longer story. So um, I had gotten interested a little bit in my heritage, you know, um, and I thought, well, and I talked to my dad and he said, well, his, his uh, grandparents were Norwegian and um, in German. And so I thought, oh, Norwegian, that sounds good, kind of fits with my outdoor interests. And so I started thinking, well, maybe I should learn Norwegian. It seems like an interesting language. So I got, you know, the spoken Norwegian book by Haugen, and I started reading through it. And then I sent a note out uh, to uh, everybody at Park back in the day. We, we were the only people who had email. So I sent email out to everybody and said, does anybody know uh, anybody who speaks Norwegian so I can go talk to them or, you know, practice? And Adele sent me a note back and said, oh, we have a professor from in the University of Oslo coming with his family to spend a year with us at LRG, so that should satisfy your Norwegian speaker request. So Trygvi Ranskaug came, Trygvi, the inventor of Model View Controller, which is still in use today, that, that framework and paradigm, came with, his, uh, with Oddberg and Gina, the, one of his daughters, and they were in, at Park for a year. And so I got to know them, of course, and become good friends with them. And I taught Gina how to play tennis. And then at the end of that time, Trygvi had to go back to Norway, but he wanted to keep working on small talk. So he made a deal, you know, the University of Oslo, actually at the time, it wasn't the university, but it was the Central Institute for Industrial Research in Norway, made a deal with, um, with Park to have a license, get a copy of the small talk image but they didn't have altos or dorados right so they wanted to get it to run on their machine their machine was called a micron 2000 and it was a, a you know prototype machine i think there was only one so i don't know who maybe adele again or or maybe it was uh alan said oh well we'll just send bruce over there right he like he wants to go to norway anyway so they made a deal um i had to go through and i guess i was 19 uh, had to go through a background check and all these things, right? Because we were sending this technology out of the country. Uh, and I went to Norway and I implemented Smalltalk, the, the, the system on this Micron 2000. And it was the, you know, I had the image, which was, you know, all the Smalltalk code, but I had to write the virtual machine, which was going to be based on the note taker virtual machine, which was an 8086 assembly code. Um, of course, this being a different machine, there was a lot of work to do to make it all work. So I ended up writing a um, kind of a support system in UCSD Pascal for debugging and bringing up Smalltalk. And so I could actually introspect into Smalltalk and look at the, look at the objects with this UCSD Pascal debugger that I had written. And, um, and I eventually got it working. And I think that that became uh, a system they used for many years after that. Um, I, one of the other Norwegian guys, I did basically before I left, I kind of handed off the whole development to him, and they he kept working on it and, and moved on. But that was uh, that was a great experience. It was only six months actually, 
Um, but I ended up going back to Norway a couple of times after that. It was a great experience. But uh, I lived in the basement of the building where I worked. I lived in, the, it's called a Hubel, and uh, the place was called SE, Central Institute for Industrial, Industrial Forschning. And I would just go upstairs to work and then come down, and they had a cafeteria, so I hardly ever had to leave. But once a week I would go to Trigvi and Odbjörg's house and do laundry and have dinner. So that was also a great experience, but it was kind of a lonely experience. I kind of, uh, all I did was work and, and visit with Trigvi. So, but it was, it was super great, super great. I do remember buying, um, this is kind of a funny story. I was just barely speaking Norwegian and buying a big, uh, big thing of yogurt at the local store. And the yogurt in, in Norway at the time was just tremendous. Like I thought, this is yogurt. And walking back to the front of the store and tripping and dropping and seeing the yogurts go all over the floor. And that made me speechless. I couldn't say a word in Norwegian, but they, they ran out and they cleaned it up and they handed me a new one. And I thought, wow, what a country. <laughs> that yeah, sounds great. Amazing place. I just love Norway. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So this all predated Small Talk 80, right? Um, yeah. So, what, so was, was any of that work, um, did that, that have any impact on, on the later Small Talk 80 work um, when you know, it was being ported to other, other environments? Oh, I'm sure it did. I mean, by then, things were, you know, I was finishing up college, right? And I ended up, at that point, I wasn't very involved in the Small Talk 80 system at all. And I was finishing up being at Stanford and trying to decide what to do next. And I'd been at Park for a bunch of years. And I remember talking to Adele and, and everybody and, and, you know, what should I do next? And Adele suggested, you know, maybe, maybe I should go to Apple or somewhere. Um, you know, of course, before that, um, a number of people are started to move on. You know, Larry Tesler, I, I was working on The Note Taker with Larry. And I remember um, going out to pizza with Larry one evening and he kind of said, you know, I'd really like to see this this kind of stuff out in the world, maybe I, I'm thinking about leaving Park. And I said, well, maybe you should go to Apple. And it turns out he'd already been thinking about Apple and he'd already was gonna go to Apple. And so when that opportunity came to me, you know, it was, it was Apple or VLSI Technology, which was founded by Doug Fairbairn. Right. And um, Doug was one of my favorite people of all time. So basically I accepted the job from Doug just before um, I was, brought into the reality distortion field by Steve Jobs and he changed my mind over a weekend and I had to call Doug and say, I changed my mind, I'm going to Apple. But um, that was in late 81. So I didn't have a whole lot to do with the um, small talk 80 at that point. Okay. Um, let's, uh, so the, of course the Apple stuff I wanna talk more, more about, but mm -hmm. um, let's, let's go back a little bit. Um, so, so you mentioned you mentioned you know you had this close relationship with Trig V, um, you know. So, you know, did did you see him, you know? Did so did did you sort of understand what was happening with him developing Model View Controller at that point in time, or did did you witness any of that, or were you sort of aware of what was what he was working on? I think I was enough in my own world. I think I was working on either at, at the Dorado probably at that point. That I really didn't. Uh, we didn't talk about work so much. Um, mostly, he was just, you know, a, an older friend and mentor, kind of. Uh, especially when I went to uh, to Norway. Um, but I, I just, you know, he was a friend of the family. You know, he was. I was a friend of his family. Um, so I, we didn't really talk about work. I think he was very engaged with the rest of the group. Um, doing doing his his work yeah yeah okay um so that you, you talked about being at uh being at stanford so like how did you how did you manage well first of all like when did you start college at stanford and then how did you manage that's funny being an undergrad and also working at park at the same time it was very tough okay so i started in fall of 77 and the way it worked is I went a year and then I took a year off and I'd spend it at Park and then I went a year and I took another year off and I went to Norway, I guess, and then I went a year and finished. So um, I got done in three and a half years or something, but I, would, I never went like more than one year at a time at Stanford. 
um, mostly because I was drawn to, you know, working on small talk and, and computing in general. And, and just, you know, that was the time, you know, things were happening. And so I took advantage of that. You could go to college any time, right? But, uh, but being able to work at Park when things were really hopping or being able to, you know, help bring small talk up in, in Norway, I mean, man, that was, that was really what was going on. Yeah. Um, and I remember I turned 21 in Norway. So that must have been, you know, 1980, summer of 80. Wow. And so did you major in computer science or um, did you do something else? At, at Stanford, I majored in mathematical sciences, which is kind of a concrete mathematics. Um, you know, when I went to Carnegie Mellon for grad school, I, had a, I did computer science, uh, master's and PhD. Okay. And that was much later? That was much later. Okay. Right. Well, that was we'll, after we'll, Apple. Okay. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so you, you mentioned that the, you know, the, the Smalltalk 76 on the Dorado was the one used in the right. demos right. when Steve Jobs visited. So where were you when, when that happened? And could you maybe discuss like what your perspective of that situation was? So I was in the building, I was, you know, about four offices down from where the demo was occurring. And that was basically, it was Dan and I think Larry were giving the demo uh, of various things. And it was, it went on for a number of hours and there were a lot of people around and, and mostly I was just kind of, kind of hanging out and looking. And I did see um, every once in a while, Steve would kind of leave the group, Steve Jobs would leave the group and kind of pace around and think about things. and. At one point, and I think this is um, something that Larry mentioned too, is he, he started waving his hands and just saying, what are you guys doing? You know, you, this should be out in the world. Something to that effect. Um, so it obviously impacted Steve tremendously, um, just kind of what was possible with small talk. And there's, all, there's the, there's the um, story about where Steve was looking at the screen and said, you know, I, I don't like the way the text scrolls, you know, it should, it's jumping by a whole line, it should, uh, you know, should smooth scroll. And, and Dan basically went in, into the small talk system, spent a couple of minutes, made the change, and all of a sudden we had smooth scrolling. And that's something you can't do in any kind of production system today. So um, that blew away Steve, and he, Steve even said that he didn't recognize the importance of object-oriented programming and live programming uh, you know, being able to make those types of changes, dynamic programming, um, at runtime, you know, while you're just sitting in the environment. That's another thing we're kind of missing today, the kind of the environment-based programming, which makes so much possible and really makes it easy to, to turn around changes and make, make progress. I mean, that's the reason that all of the amazing things were developed in Smalltalk, because Smalltalk was so easy to experiment in and try things out and immediately get feedback. Right. It would have taken much, much longer in a standard, you know, edit, compile, link, run, debug environment. Just probably not possible. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify, you were still um, a member of Park at that time. I was still a member of Park at that time. I know that, you know, there's been various stories told and, you know, things interleave a little bit differently, but I was still a uh, Park, member of Park and I went to Apple after that, somewhat after that, because Steve, of course, knew that I was at Park. There had been a Park. Um, it was still a Park at the time, actually, um, when he kind of, uh, well, so the way it worked was I actually called Larry Tesler when I was looking for a job. I said, hey, Larry, I'm thinking about maybe coming to, to Apple. And so Larry was the person who kind of brought me in and showed me the Lisa and, and kind of figured out the kind of person I was and realized I'd be better in the Mac group, so introduced me to Steve. So even though I had seen the Lisa first and the Mac was not as far along, it was more kind of my thing. And so the Mac group being much, much smaller, you know, I could get in earlier and do more. Um, but that was thanks to Larry, you know, realizing the kind of person I was and what, you know, where I could really apply, you know, my my passions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. So. Um, so going back, were, did you were you actually able to meet any of the the delegation from Apple during that visit? I don't think I went and talked to them. I, I thought that was kind of beyond above my pay scale. Okay. 
<laughs> but I did see them, you know, I, I was there kind of checking things out and I talked to our, our guys afterwards, right, just to see, you know, what was that about, you know, how did that go and, and so on. But, uh, but no, I never met any of the Apple people. Um, and the Apple people was Steve and, and um, I think, uh, of course, Bill Atkinson was there. Um, I, I can't remember the other people, but they're, they're a handful, a handful of people who ended up being big in the Lisa team. Yeah. Okay, so then you graduated from Stanford in 1981. Okay, mm -hmm. so the same. So obviously, right after that is when you decided to. Uh, you're deciding between VLSI and, and Apple. Right. So that's when I went to to Apple. Right. Yeah. So basically, both people you'd worked with on the Note Taker were Doug on the Note Taker uh, on uh, VLSI, and then Larry. Right. <laughs> at Apple. Right, exactly. I, it was funny because I've never really kind of interviewed for jobs or never had to look for a job before because I just knew the people and I'd go talk to them. Um, and so, you know, of course, um, it was a very tough decision because I, I had huge respect for Doug Fairbairn and huge respect for Larry, of course. And um, I guess I just I, I felt after the, the reality distortion field kicked in that I could do something bigger with the Mac, and uh, and Steve was right. I mean, I think that Mac had a much bigger impact on the world, and I was able to do more and have a more fundamental effect on kind of where computing was going. You know, Steve really believed that that we were be, do, building something for the creative class and for every person to be a, a better person, be able to do more, um, be able to express themselves more. And I believe that, and Steve was right, and uh, that's exactly how the Mac kind of impacted the world. It just made computing available to everybody. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have been part of that. Yeah. So you mentioned that, so it was Larry that um, sort of directed you to, to talk to Steve to join the Mac team. Right. And so was that your first ever um, encounter with Steve? Yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah. So, so describe what that was like meeting him for the first time and, and being and then being part of the, you know the reality distortion field. So part of it was you know um, yeah I had come from Park where the technology was already in place the technology of the future was there and I was using it you know small talk and bitmap displays and the mouse and laser printing and Ethernet and email and everything and here I was coming to Apple where the had a little personal computer that couldn't talk to anything else and you could program it in basic and so on and that's what you had you know the, and so I was kind of like huh you know I don't, I don't know um, I mean this this is interesting and Steve basically said look um, you know we're gonna bring this all this great technology to the world and I just remember being I, I was a little skeptical kind of a little bit uh, you know standing back like oh, well show me and you know in my mind his enthusiasm and his passion were just overwhelming. And he brought me around and showed me, um, you know, here's, here's what the box is gonna look like. Jerry Manick is designing this amazing box. Check this box out. This is how it's gonna be built. And here's a, you know, George Crow doing the analog. It's amazing. Um, and it's, look how small it is. Look how well designed it is, you know. And, and here's, the, here's the software team, and, which was like six people or something. Andy Hertzfeld showing me a demo of this thing. And, uh, and then I was actually really blown away by the demo that Andy showed me because it had like the mouse and menus and it had little bouncing graphics. And I thought, I remember thinking at the time, well, shoot, you guys are almost done. Of course, I was completely <laughs> over underestimating how much work there was to do still to make that real. But um, I would say that Andy's demo of what the Mac was even, even then in 81 uh, was the thing that kind of put me over. It's like, wow, that I could see having that in my house. I could see my mom using that, and uh, I want to be part of that. And but you know, even even after that, I did tell Doug that I would go to to VLSI Technology, and then Steve called me on Friday after I told Doug, and Steve said, "What do you think of Apple?" And I said, "Well, I decided to go to VLSI Technology and work with Doug Fairbairn." And he said, "You did what? You come back in tomorrow." tomorrow morning, I have so much more to show you, blah, 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 and that, that's when the whole reality distortion thing came in. Uh, he kind of, I guess, bullied me even into, into coming back to Apple the next day, 
And then I spent the entire weekend with Steve, taking me around, talking to more and more people. And by the end of the weekend, I was convinced. And I had to call Doug on Monday, tell him I changed my mind. And, and that, was, that was very, very hard, actually. Um, but Doug was understanding. And just, you know, the great guy he is, he, he, he got that that was probably a better choice for me. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Steve doesn't take, like to take no for an answer. <laughs> no, he doesn't take no for an answer. No, absolutely not. You know, Steve, Steve gets what he wants, and he's very convincing. You know, and, and he has good arguments. I mean, he, he, knew, he knew what he wanted, and he knew how to get it. You know? I mean, Steve is a genius, right? Brilliant guy. Uh, not just in his vision for what the Mac was or what Apple should be, but kind of how to find the right people and how to get them to do things. Um, he wasn't always perfect about that. You know, he might have used one technique a few too many times. Uh, you know, maybe that's not the right technique to use on Bruce, where it might be the right one on somebody else. Um, but, uh, but he did get things done. Um, I do find it interesting that, <clears throat> you know, was it because, you know, some of the, your work um, at PARC was on um, pretty low level stuff, right? Like you mentioned, like the BIOS for the, the note taker. Right. You know the microcode for the for the small talk Dorado. Right. Was that the reason that Larry thought that you were better suited for the Mac versus instead of the Lisa? It's possible. I, I can't ask Larry anymore, sadly. But um, I, that may be the case um, because I ended up doing most of my work in assembly code on the Mac, very very low level, um, and so you know that suited me actually. It was it was. For me, it was a lot of fun, and actually the 68000 was a tremendous instruction set, very easy to work with, um, orthogonal. I could literally think and type at the same speed, um, so it's a good match to my thinking speed. But I, I wrote a ton of uh, assembly code for the Mac. Yeah. So most of the code that you wrote was in assembly? 98% uh, of it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so when you when you first started on the team, what what were you assigned to do? So they had this concept of the finder. Uh, Bud Tribble had, you know, the, the idea of you know how do you find things on the disk and so on, and so Bud had this idea, and so uh, Andy and I talked about it, and I ended up doing this thing. I don't know what we called it, the mini finder or something, and it looked like a floppy disk, and it had little tabs that were the file names, and it had a do it button from, you know, because first we had do it was one of the things in Smalltalk is like execute this thing. Um, so you just click on a tab and you click do it and it would launch that program. Uh, but then I had an idea of, you know, the, the files and folders idea. And I had never seen the star, but I kind of was aware of the concept of, of you know, that you would want to fo file things, of course, because I had used, you know, uh, all of Smalltalk, or, sorry, all of the, uh, the park systems like Bravo and Gypsy and so on, and I knew about filing and, and hierarchy uh, for files and so on. So I thought I would do that instead, and the idea of, you know, you could open a, open a folder and look at it and close it and so on, That I did a, a demo of that, um, actually from not even looking at the file system, but just looking at a, a text file that kind of described what a file system might look like. So it read in the text file and you could kind of navigate this, and that was my demo of what I think it should look like. And then I ended up writing the real finder after that. And then toward the end, Steve Capps came in and, and we pushed it over the line. Um, but the, at the time, I was, you know, because I'm, I kind of think of foundational things, I was thinking, well, how, how am I going to store the icons? How am I going to store, you know, the strings and so on? And one of the things that I cared about was uh, I wanted to make these uh, these programs be able to be done in different languages and not have to rewrite the code, right? So I wanted to separate out the, the, all the language stuff from all the code itself. And, you know, I, I started thinking about, well, you know, if I had a little object-oriented database, uh, which I, you know, because being in a small talk team, I was thinking about objects, we could actually do that. So I ended up kind of going off of my track uh, and st I just kind of stopped working on the finder and working on the fundamental part that would support the finder and everything else with this little object-oriented database, which was called uh, the resource manager, actually. And so I, you know, I, I said I want to do this thing, I and I talked to Andy, and Andy and Larry 
Kenyon basically got on board and Andy ended up rewriting a lot of the Mac toolbox to use the, the resource manager and then of course the Finder used it for what was called the desktop database that kept not only the, you know, the icons but how, how types and uh, applications would connect and you would know that you know, if you click on this thing and you want to open it, it should run this application. All that was stored in the desktop database and that was all managed by the resource manager. Yeah. Okay, so the the um, sort of the file type and um, information for you know this type of file belongs to this this application. Um, so that was something that you and Andy created. Yeah, I I thought of it and and I had this idea of a type and a creator. Right. And Andy, you know, Andy was I thought of Andy as the Yoda of the Mac group. Right. Andy was like the, the wise guy, wise smart guy that you would bounce ideas off of, and and Andy um, Andy used the resource manager for Windows and menus and all sorts of things. Um, but the the concept of a type and a creator was unique and new to the Mac, where the creator would basically be what an application would export as this is who I am, and the type was the file would say this is the kind of thing I am, and you would bind those together. Um, so the type and creator system was the thing that allowed you to, to, for example, name a file anything you like, and all of the, the type and creator information would be hidden away in the, in the file system that Larry did. Um, and that was just a, a, a bonus. We wanted to name anything you wanted to name and type it with spaces, and we didn't want to have file name suffixes or any of that stuff. We just wanted it to be very natural. And so type and creator kind of came out of that. Right, so like from the beginning the design was no, we're not, we're not going to do extensions. We're, you know, no, we're no. going to just do normal names. These things are objects, yeah. right? They have types. They're, they're of, a, of a particular kind, right? We want a file to be an object. And right. so if a file's an object, where do you keep its type? And if it's uh, going to be manipulated by an application, how does it know? And all that had to be part of the, um, part of the, the, the system um, that was built and supported by the resource manager, the type and creator. Oh, okay. And right. Desktop Be database. Right, because the whole thing was 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 object oriented in your mind. In, the, in the my way, mind, yeah. yeah. I, I grew up thinking object oriented because I came out of LRG and and I wanted to do as much as I could that would make the system be as dynamic as it as it was in the small talk world. Um, of course, you know you can't do that if you're you're you've got a tiny tiny computer. Your operating system is all in assembly code in in ROM. How do you make things dynamic? And the, the best I could do was this object-oriented database and the concept of, of separating out the non-logical part of the program into, into a separate area called the resource fork, which is where all the strings for the program, all the dialogues, menu bars, all those things that you would change when you're changing the program from English to Norwegian, you could just change all that separately and all the logic would stay the same and you wouldn't have to recompile it. So that was kind of what I was trying to do is like, how do we get dyna dynamic, you know, kind of capabilities into this tiny machine? And that was the best I could do at the time. Yeah. So then the idea of saving that information into a separate fork, that you came up with that as well? I think maybe that was something I, that Larry came up with when I was talking with him, Larry Kenyon. Um, the idea that there'd be a separate part. Um, I probably was thinking it would all be that that would be the only thing, right? I used to think, you know, maybe I thought the file was just the object-oriented database, but Larry, uh, Larry decided that there should be two forks, and it made it easier, and you could open the resource fork separate from the data fork. It turned out for an application, the data fork was empty. So it was the case that the resource fork was basically the entire program, and there were code resources that would be loaded from that part too. Um, for documents, you would have uh, the document data in the data fork, which the, da the type of that document represented in that data fork, and the resource fork was for other things. So the other things might be, here are fonts that need to be used for this particular document, for example, things like that. Wasn't really used so much um, in, in the end, but, uh, but that was the intent. Right, okay. I remember, you know, later on the Mac had the, the ResEdit program that would allow you to edit these. What, was there a ver an early version of that back, back in the, uh, the original Mac, or was that something that was made later? No, that was. I think we had ResEdit in the original Mac. Okay. I mean, if if I 
had to guess who wrote it, it was probably Steve Capps. Um, I don't really remember, I should call Steve and ask him, but that was, uh, that's the kind of thing, he could bang these programs out in no time. And, um, but, but that was one of the things that we used to kind of show, show that we could actually change things and, uh, without having to recompile a program. And ResEdit became you know, one of the fun things people would do with their Macs. It's like, oh gosh, look what I can do. I can totally customize my Mac however I want. I can change the menus. I can change you know, uh, how this program works or what the program looks like, I should say. Um, and people did a lot of that and there was a ton of creativity kind of um, expressed through ResEdit and a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember, you know, my, my, my first computer was a Mac, uh, and I remember starting to play with Resident myself, so it was definitely one of those early experiences where I'm like, oh, I'm actually getting into the system, and I'm right. actually getting to explore what, you know, the fonts and the different pictures and whatever the various resources and assets that are in this program. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so exactly. that was, yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. Um, Let's see, um, okay, we, got, we did that part. Um, um, okay, so the, oh, here's one, one thing that I was, was interested in. So I think um, folklore.org mentions that some of the finder design might have been influenced by um, something that was done at MIT called Dataland. No, I not knew true. nothing about Data Land. Okay. No, no. I mean, the only influences I had at the time um, was Park, right? Was Smalltalk. Um, so I knew nothing of Data Land. I mean, the Finder kind of came out of um, my interpretation of what one could do with a little computer based on what I, you know, grew up with at Park. Um, I didn't know anything about Data Land. Okay. Yeah. Um. So your your decision to stop working on the Finder and spend a, you know a lot of time working on the Resource Manager became kind of a contentious issue with management. Right. Is that something you can talk about? Well, so um, uh, Bob Melville, who had been at at Park, he was our manager, and you know Bob was a very uh, very solid kind of software manager engineer type, uh, also very um, kind of old school. And you know, most of the people in this in the in the Mac group were pretty young. You know, we were all in our twenties, and none of us really had a whole lot of experience with um, authoritative management. And so, especially me. And so, um, Bob and I disagreed on the importance of the resource manager. And I I just wouldn't yield. I basically said, no, we have to have this right because I was counting on it for the for the finder. Uh, Bob thought, you know, what's what's this computer? It's just going to be another computer down the road, another one after that. You know, what's so special about this Mac? And I thought it was, you know, here is my chance to really do it right the way I thought it should be done. And so I, I basically just told him, I, I have to do this. And I had backup from, from Andy and also from Steve to, you know, to, to finish the resource manager. And I do remember at one point promising something about being done in two or three months and I put stickies up, um, you know, day by day all around my, my cube, you know, three months worth and I'd pull one down every day. Um, and Andy recalls that after the last one was pulled down, I kept working on the resource manager anyway, but by then it was obvious that it was, uh, it was the right thing to do. Um, but yeah, there was some contention, you know, it was, it was tough because, you know, we were a little bit renegade, you know, in the, in the Mac group. Um, we were kind of on a mission. Um, you know, thanks to Steve, he, he told us we were on a mission. And so we kind of felt we had latitude to do um, whatever we thought was necessary. And that didn't necessarily match with kind of a standard, you know, software production method or, you know, prioritization that one would bring in from, from someone with a military background as Bob had or, or kind of a, a, an old school kind of big company background. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, it, I mean, I mean, curious though. Like, so if you if you had not done the resource manager, what was what would have been the technical alternative um, to to solve you know to provide the same fun, kind of functionality? I, you know, see, I don't actually know. I, I even now I think um, it would have really it would have really hamstrung the Mac. I mean, I don't think it would have been possible to do 
you know, have the internationalizable systems that we had. Um, I, I think that we probably wouldn't have been able to do the complex programs that we'd had because the, the resource manager would allow you to kind of swap in and out objects as you needed them. And, you know, we were so constrained with memory that we needed that capability and it, you know, it slowed the system down, but on the other hand, you could do things. If you didn't have a little object-oriented database, everything would have always had to be basically in memory or you'd have to have some other mechanism, which would be simply you know, as, as complicated as the resource manager, if not more, but limited, right? So I wanted to do the generalizable thing, foundation that would actually make all these things possible. So I, I thought that was the only option at the time. And, and even now, I have to think about you know, what, what were the options. I still would probably go with something like that, maybe something a little more sophisticated, but I only had 3K bytes of assembly code to work with. That was what was left in the ROM, um, and to, to build an object-oriented database uh, in assembly code. So um, it, it worked out, but it was a struggle, you know, to make it fit. Yeah. Wow. Um, let's see. So who who do you, who else did you work really closely with in the team? Well, pretty much everybody. The team was small, right? We had 12 people at the time, I think, when the Mac uh, shipped out. 12 people in the small talk, actually small talk. 12 people in the Mac group, right, in the software group. Um, so I worked, you know, obviously Andy, the Yoda of the team, um, and Larry Kenyon did the, op, you know, basically the file system and a bunch of other things. Um, Steve Caps, of course, and I worked, you know, side by side late at night listening to Violent Femmes finishing up the Finder. Um, Caps is probably one of the best programmers I've ever met, along with Andy, I mean, and, and Larry. These people are amazing. Um, of course, uh, Larry uh, ended up marrying Patty. Patty Kang became Kenyon, and she was our software um, librarian. And, you know, we were a very close team. And, of course, um, Burl Smith, who did the hardware. So. Even though he did the hardware, he was kind of part of our, our group. He was a good friend of Andy's. And we, we all, you know, we'd have dinner together all the time. It was kind of a family thing. So I, I would say, you know, who'd you work closely with? Well, we're all working hard on our parts. We all had to collaborate because it was such a tight system. And we just, we just like family. It was great. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, sort of the the way that Steve would like motivate the group. Um, mm -hmm. Is is there some example of that that you you could you could give us? Oh about? sure, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, he would come by and he'd look at everything and and he would have comments and he. I think, for example, you know, the title bar of the window should look a certain way. And I think Susan did dozens of examples before, you know, Steve signed off and said that looks good enough. Um, one one thing I remember and um, is Larry Kenyon had done the formatting software, so you format a disk when you put it in, and that was another kind of innovation of the Mac. Is if you have a disk and you put it in, it's not formatted; it would format it for you. Uh, on the PC, you were out of luck if you were trying to save something and you didn't have a formatted disk; it wouldn't couldn't do that. So Larry built the system and built the file system and wrote the formatter, and we you know demoed it to Steve. And I remember Steve saying. Um, how long did that take or something? And it was like three minutes. And he says, three minutes? That's way too long. We're going to have millions and millions of users. If you save two minutes off of that, that will be years. It will save years off people's lives. So you have to make it faster. And so Larry went and he just optimized the heck out of it and made it a bunch faster. And so he would think, you know, Steve would think of all these creative reasons that are kind of outlandish about why you should do something. It's like saving lives by making a faster formatter, right? I, that was kind of crazy, but, but you know, we got the point. You know, we got the point that it was important. Um, and he would come by, and, and one day, you guys are the greatest, and the next day, you guys are idiots, and, um, you know, he kind of kept you on your toes by be, being, you know, critical, but in a, in a, in a way where he was motivating, you know. We, we, we took criticism in the right way. He didn't, like, stop us. It was like, okay, we can do this better. And did, you know, the, um, one of the stories um, about Steve is that he sort of pitted the Mac group against the, 
the Lisa team in some way? Like there was this rivalry that he stoked. Did, is that something that you felt? So, you know, I, I didn't feel a rivalry so much as kind of a race. So it's like, we both want to get this thing out. Let's see how we can do. Let's get this thing done. Um, you know, we had, uh, basically Bill Atkinson was the, was from the Lisa team and he was also our team, right? So he was our bridge between Lisa and Mac. And he actually brought all the work he did uh, on Quick Draw, you know, from kind of Lisa to the Mac and had to rewrite it for the Mac to make it tiny and assembly code and, and fit in the ROM, which basically took up half of the ROM. Um, but I, I don't, I didn't remember feeling a rivalry. Mostly, you know, we were very focused on what we were doing and just getting it done as fast as possible and getting this out. Um, you know, the, with that kind of focus, you don't think much about what other teams are doing. Um, let's see. So you also worked on the dialogue manager, right? So the dialogue manager was just you know how do you how do you ask questions of the user, get some answers, fill in some fields, and so on. Um, the dialogue manager ended up being an extension of the window manager that Andy had written, and I designed it so that it was you know compatible. So a, a window. A dialogue window was still a window, so it was kind of a subclassing concept that you know I had learned in Smalltalk. It's like, well, okay, you know, if if you make a if you extend the window data structure with some things on the end that make it a dialogue, um, it's still a window as far as the window manager is concerned. So you can do all the window things, but also you have a little bit new functionality uh, that makes possible is made possible by the uh, additional things at the end of the data structure. So I worked on that and, and, um, and you know, wrote that code. And I'm pretty sure it's one of those things where a bunch of people had concepts that they wanted to put in and help me with some things. And you know, I'm pretty sure that Caps wrote a little piece of that here and there as, as was necessary. And you know, we all kind of pitched in and made things happen um, when needed. And you know, I was kind of overloaded. We were all a little bit overloaded. But um, Steve Caps basically had uh, the ability to dive in at any point and and work on any part of the system and make it make it better. Yeah. Wow. He's an amazing guy. <laughs> That's an incredible skill. <laughs> yeah. Um, were there any other parts of the of the Macintosh toolbox um, ROM that that you contributed to? Really, so the resource manager, the dialogue manager, and the finder, and the concept of type and creator, um, you know, desktop database, just what the how the finder worked. Um, that was primarily what I did. Um, you know, I helped a little bit on the on the demo that was shown at the introduction. Um, again, we all kind of dove in on that. You know, Andy and Steve Caps and I and Susan Kerr and a bunch of people worked on little pieces of that. Um, but yeah, I think Finder, Finder, and uh, Resource Manager, Dialog Manager were really my primary contributions, and Type and Creator and that whole kind of architecture. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> that's, that's it was a, a lot of fun. That's a lot of stuff. A lot of work. I mean, the Finder itself is is huge. Well, the Finder is 46k bytes. 46k <laughs> bytes, right? And the the Lisa filer that they had done, you know, they they kind of redid the filer after they saw the little pre demo that we did of the Finder that I did of the Finder. Um, that came that weighed in at like 360k bytes. Wow. So um, ours was only 46k. <laughs> So, so what was what was it like when 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 the Mac was introduced and sort of the the announcement and the you know and then the the nineteen eighty four ad and you know just all that hype surrounding the launch what what was it like being part of that? It was it was um, well you know we were pushing hard for that demo right I think we had. I think Steve told us only a few days before the actual introduction, oh, I, we need a software demo. We need a, an intro demo. Um, and again, I think Steve Caps and Andy kind of led that effort to have this demo and, and run something that was exciting to put on the screen. Uh, we also had that Mac speech that introduced itself. So um, that was not very many days before. So we were working all the time, you know, up to the point so when we were sitting in the front row during the introduction, it was more of a sense of massive relief. It's like, well, it's out there and it's running, right? It's actually functioning, right? We were worried 
might crash or something while we're doing this demo. Um, but uh, but it was actually running a sense of relief. And then the, you know, pretty much right after that, we all went back to the office because we knew we had more work to do. Um, and we ended up, you know, doing another release about four or five months later. I did another release of the Finder uh, to fix a bunch of bugs. I did a lot of walking around and, and going to um, computer stores to see how people use the Mac, right? You know, to, what do they do? Do they understand how it works? You know, how, how, what kinds of things do they find difficult? And I found out, and there's a story on Folklore, Andy's site, I found out people would just start typing. And the way that I had set it up is the disk that you put in that it launched off of would be highlighted oh. when the machine would start up. And because it was highlighted, if you started typing, it would actually rename the disk. Yeah. So I had to make a quick fix to, to make it so you had to do one more step uh, so that not all the disks would get named some random garbage. <laughs> Um, but those are the kinds of things you only get in user testing. We didn't do any user testing. We just made what we wanted. Um, of course, nowadays that's not possible. You have to do masses user testing and you know, all sorts of things before anything gets shipped. But um, back then it was just you know, a handful of us you know, doing the software and a bunch of people doing the hardware and marketing and less than 100 people total. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. I mean, it, it seemed like it was such a death march at the end. Were, were, it was, were you all burnt, really burnt out finishing the Mac? I think so. I think a lot of us just had worked ourselves to death, right? And um, because we believed in it, you know, when you read about what burnout is, it's, it's not that you don't believe in what you're doing. It's because you do believe in what you're doing and you just put your all into it. Uh, and so we all believed in it to the max and we just put every bit of our effort into it. So, you know, in some sense, burnout is a indication of our, you know, the passion and commitment. But yeah, after that, it's, you know, you're kind of tired and, and you, maybe you want to look at something else for a little while. Um, and, you know, you saw that, you know, people would kind of move on and after the Mac came out and some people would stick around for a while. But uh, it was it was a hard, hard push, a hard push. Um, in retrospect, what I wish I had done is just kind of taken a year off and then come back. That would have been, I mean, I don't know. The history might have just been the same anyway. But um, I still, you know, I, even to this day, I'm grateful that I get to use a Mac um, in my everyday work. And, uh, you know, there are some times, you know, in the 90s when I was a little touch and go with Apple. Uh, so I just give a ton of credit for the people who, who made it through and, and kept that, that, uh, that company going. Of course, when Steve came back, uh, when Apple bought Next, uh, that obviously, you know, Steve's genius and passion basically resurrected Apple and made it made it a real company again. Yeah. So, so you mentioned um, you should have taken a vacation. So you 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 did not take a vacation after the Mac shipped. And no. You just stayed on and kept working. Well, I, I stayed on for a little while and then I then I ended up leaving. So um, that was in '84. Um, I ended up going and working at Adobe for a little while, and then I went to grad school at Carnegie Mellon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So the, that was, was that because you felt like it was time, or the, the team had already kind of split up, and what was the reason you decided to leave I think time? the team was a little tired, you know? It was hard to keep together. Um, I was tired, and I also felt like I'd given everything and maybe that was enough for me right now. And, and I, I went to Steve and I said, you know, it's been a really great run. I, I feel like I've delivered a lot and I need to, I need to move on. So I, I told him that. Um, he tried to get me to stay, but I, I just had already made my decision um, and I wasn't gonna change it at that point. And I'm, you know, I'm glad I went to Carnegie Mellon. That was another tremendous experience. Um, couldn't have picked a better place to go and I uh, also had a good time uh, working at Adobe uh, or Chuck Yeshke and Warnock, mm -hmm. of course, ex, ex park people. Um, that was also a tremendous experience, but you know, very short. I was just a consultant, and then, the, then I ended up going to, to grad school. Right. So the, the Adobe, I mean, so you went there primarily because, because of Yeshke and Warnock, or because, um, I mean, was it because they were working on um, PostScript um, for the laser writer? Right. So the, the, they were doing the laser writer and they were doing PostScript. And 
I ended up, and I can't really remember how I got connected with Adobe, but <clears throat> it was a really small company at that point, you know, 20 or so people, 20 or 30 people, and they were out um, near Palo Alto Airport on Barcadero Road. And so I came in as, I don't think I was even an employee, but I was a consultant, and I worked on the first laser writer spooler, the idea that you could, you know, spool printing jobs to the system and it would, it would uh, you know, you could do other things while that was happening. Um, that was a learning experience too, because it was, it was uh, something I didn't really know how to do, but I, I figured it out and I got help um, from some great people at Adobe. But it was really funny because I, I at Adobe, I met a couple of guys um, uh, from Carnegie Mellon who were there for the summer, um, Randy Pausch and Mike Young. And so they were basically my age and they were grad students and I had just come from, from Apple. And I invited them over one, one day for, uh, for dinner. And I said, you know, I'm kind of thinking about going to grad school. And Randy said, you should definitely go to grad school and you should go to Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> and so basically, Randy was, you know, one of these guys who had his opinions and they were strong ones and they were well supported. And so I ended up uh, applying to CMU and going. And also talking to Geschke and saying, you know, I'm thinking about going to grad school at CMU. What do you think? You know, Geschke is CEO of, of Adobe. And if I had stayed there, I'd be retired by now, right, with lots of money. But Geschke looked at me and he sighed and he said, if I were your dad, I'd tell you to go to Carnegie Mellon. And that's all he said, right? So kind of the implication was, I'm not your dad, you should probably stay here. Um, but he said, if I were your dad, so I took that advice and I thought, well, that's good advice. And I went to CMU and I'm not, I don't regret it. I mean, I, you go through life once and you make choices and your path through life is what it is. But, uh, and CMU was a tremendous experience and met a lot of great people. Um, but I'm still working, I'm still working today. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, who did? Who, um, what, what was? What did you study at CMU, and, and who was your advisor? So, um, I was a computer science grad student. Um, um, actually, um, Jim Morris and Jeanette Wing were my co-advisors. Um, Jim Morris actually uh, invented a number of interesting algorithms, like Knuth Morris Pratt. Really interesting guy. He has a book out. Um, I think Tales of a Computer Scientist. I can't remember the name of his book, but it's a great, great book, kind of of his life. Um, and Jeanette, um, I went to Jeanette uh, as I was getting close to finishing, and I asked Jeanette if she would be my co-advisor because I just needed to get finished. And Jeanette had a um, reputation of being the dragon lady, uh, just super smart and super tough, and she got her students out. So Jeanette um, agreed to be my co-advisor and guide me uh, through the finish. So the two of them, you know, I can't thank them enough for making my time at CMU uh, productive and, and, and fun, actually. But I did work, work really hard. Jeanette, in particular, really was a great, uh, great at the last bit of my um, kind of PhD work. Um, Morris was fantastic at kind of get me, getting me into the system and figuring out, you know, helping me figure out what to do. And supporting me, yeah, 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 incredibly important. They are just tremendous people. Yeah. yeah, I feel so lucky when I kind of think in retrospect about the people that I met from, you know, Park and Adobe and and Carnegie Mellon, and um, I can't imagine how lucky I am for the the person that I am and what I learned and the opportunity I've been given by these people. Um, so I just I just am grateful every day for that. Um, that kind of path through life and the people I met. So what was your thesis about? So it's funny, my, my thesis was called Siri, S-I-R-I, just like Apple Siri. Um, it's the girl's name in Norwegian, and it was a... Um, no relation though, right? No relation, no relation to Apple Siri, um, but it was kind of an exercise in how small can you make a programming language that did object-oriented programming and constraints at the same time, so constrained objects. Um, I was influenced, of course, by small talk. I was also influenced by work um, done in Denmark on a, a system called Beta. And I ended up with a, a little programming language that 
more of a to more of a toy programming language, but showing how small one could express the the constrained object concept. And so that's what it was. It actually it did run, but it was super duper slow. It would have had a I had to have a lot of work to make it into a real language. Um, and uh, it was more of a kind of a exploratory paradigm. It was interesting, though. It was fun. Was was Eiffel also like a object-oriented, constraint-based language? I don't think so. No, Eiffel was. I don't know enough about Eiffel. I can't remember. But it was the other object-oriented constraint language was uh, at, that was very contemporaneous was Kaleidoscope oh. by Bjorn Freeman Benson, who happens to be one of my best friends now. Um, Bjorn and I were doing uh, similar theses at the same time. Um, I got Bjorn into flying. We, uh, we've stayed close ever since. So I've known Bjorn forever. But he, he had done Kaleidoscope. And that he was um, uh, advised by Alan Borning, who had been at Park and had done uh, Thing Lab, which was one of the early object-oriented constraint systems. Um, Thing Lab was an eye-opening and amazing system at the time. And, and uh, Bjorn's thesis was kind of taking that to the next level. And mine was kind of going to the other way. It's like, well, how small can it be? How, how, how um, expressive can you be in the smallest possible space? Right. So, so were you? So you had already been aware of Thing Lab from before? Oh yeah, I think I was aware of Thing Lab, and I thought, what a neat idea. But um, I don't, I don't really remember um, it influencing you that much because I didn't know about the, the um, internals of Thing Lab. I just thought it was an interesting idea. I was more um, actually motivated by the idea that a constraint system would be useful in, 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 in um, graphical user interfaces, like you know, forcing things to have certain relationships on the screen and so on, which is kind of a, you know, not a very important part of what constraint systems could do. But at the time, it was like, how do you build interfaces in an easy way, how do you describe them, express them in an easy way? That was what I was driving me, less than the simulation of kind of the real world that Thing Lab was uh, so good at. Right, okay. Yeah. So that's actually kind of like the way auto layout works today. Right, right. Okay. So I'm sure auto layout's way more sophisticated than what I did. Um, and similarly, I thought, I thought Kaleidoscope had, had fundamentally better ideas than, than I had, but mine were different enough that they were they're interesting and could have been explored more. Um, so, so you uh, finished grad school um, when? I think it was 1994, January of 94. Okay. <clears throat> um, so then was that, after that is when you went to, um, well, on your, on your Resume, you, you've listed that you were sort of doing a lot of different consulting for different companies. I was doing a ton of different consulting. So kind of from 94 to 2007, I was just consulting and doing little projects. Um, I had this idea that I could work remotely. So I'd bought a house in the Eastern Sierra at Mammoth Lakes. And I was trying to work remotely and do projects. So I did lots of consulting projects from there. And I also had a project of my own. It was called iFile. The idea was that, you know, what would a a fresh take on the the Finder desktop look like if everything was an object, including your emails and your photos and your files and ev and your messages, all of those. What if they were all a uniform object space? What would that look like? And if you could then uh, kind of read the text in your documents and so on, um, what kinds of things you do with some rudimentary natural language processing to do automatic collections. So that was what iFile was like uh, about and I was working on that 100% on my own, writing it in C++ on the Mac. Um, again, that was probably something I could have done in one-fifth the time if I had been using Smalltalk. Um, and it, it never shipped, but you know, I used it for quite some time myself and it was, um, it was I think the ideas even today are, are worthy. Um, I'd have a different approach to doing it, but I think having a kind of a unified space where you had everything is, has value. Apple and other companies went a different way, which is for every type of media, right, your photos, your messages, you know, your texts, there's a different app. So there's the messages app, or there's the photos app, and then there's the finder, which is for files. Um, they're just different apps. 
uh, I, my idea was there would be one app. Mm -hmm. There would be this thing called iFile and all that stuff would come in and be automatically organized for you. Right, but I think you know, in the mid 90s, there were attempts at doing things like OpenDoc, um, right. that, that more document focus that sounds similar to what you right. were doing. Right, so actually one of my friends uh, is Kurt Pearsall, one of the, one of the architects of OpenDoc. Um, I think it's just a really hard problem. Um, it never really made it at Apple because it was just, I think, too hard to, for developers to kind of get engaged in. And also just, it's easier to write uh, an application that you own end to end than to write something that gets plugged into a bigger system where you don't actually know if your application is running. I mean, yes, there's a, there's a photo editor in your document. Whose photo editor is it? You know, how do you pay for that? How do you get, you know, compensation? It, it, it kind of goes against the market reality, whereas if you have a branded thing like Photoshop, um, you can pay for it, right? So um, an integrated system kind of goes against the market. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, Smalltalk is also an integrated system. It doesn't really have individual applications, although I guess you can make individual applications. But right. um, uh, but you've never you've never done any like commercial Smalltalk. Never done any commercial small talk work. Although there's there is commercial small talks out there. There are commercial small talks, and there are um, small talks with the capability of building an application and then exporting that application as a standalone thing. Although I don't, I'm not have any experience with those things. But I think that's the way to go. Is is do all of your development in a small talk system, push a button, and get you know a built application out that you can market as a separate entity. Um, I kind of hoped that that would happen with Smalltalk back in the day. Uh, Smalltalk had its kind of dual purpose. You know, one was like this evolving system that kept changing, and you have Smalltalk 72 to 74 to 76 to 78 to 80. Um, all of these different systems were really radically different from the previous one, and they were evolving at a tremendous rate. And as soon as Smalltalk became kind of a thing in the outside world, it stopped evolving. So. Um, that's kind of an unfortunate situation where you would like to keep doing, you know, the next small talk that has evolved within the environment of the internet of today, um, but that hasn't happened. Um, there haven't been really market uh, forces that would force that to happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing that you consulted on was for Apple's advanced technology group. Right. Right. Um, something called LiveDoc. Yeah, so Jim Miller's group at ATG was working on a system called LiveDoc. Uh, I wrote a lot of the code for that, and what it was was can, what kinds of things can you recognize in text that you can have uh, actions on, like uh, phone numbers and addresses and things like that, or even just, even just words to look up um, meanings, for example. So I wrote a little bit of that system, and we built a, a uh, version of text edit that was live, uh, live text edit, and you could actually do that. And that was a precursor to what we have on the phones today, um, where you can tap on a phone number and it will call it and so on. But um, yeah, I was a consultant at Apple. I, I guess I can't remember when that was. That was probably late 90s mm -hmm. when we were doing that. Yeah, okay. Um, and then uh, you also worked um, for Maya? Yeah, so Maya was, uh, is a company that um, Jim Morris and a number of people founded in Pittsburgh. And they, um, they were working on things that were kind of along the lines of stuff that I was interested in about you know, information visualization, user interfaces that were novel and, and advanced. And um, they had a program called Hyperfax. And I helped a little bit with that, um, with basically 3D rendering of documents, for example. And one of the things that I did was, um, because they were running on a PC, and we were writing the software that needed to do certain things with bitmaps, uh, there's a, there was a particular um, feature in the Mac OS called um, Map Region, which would take any, any region shape, and you could map it to some, some other rectangle. It would 
you would translate and, and um, modify the shape as you know, different rectangles. So shrink it or expand it or stretch it or whatever. So map region was this function, but it didn't get copied in the Windows PC OS, right? Didn't, cop didn't get copied in Windows. So um, um, I ended up um, reverse engineering it. Um, gosh, now I'm gonna have to remember his name. With, uh, with a, a Windows expert, um, I would love to come back to this if I can remember his name. Anyway, and we reverse engineered uh, the Windows region concept, and we ended up, uh, I ended up rewriting it and making a version of it, and we wrote a, an article in the Dr. Dobbs Journal uh, about this, actually. So uh, that was, uh, and we ended up using that in the Hyperpack system. Do you remember which issue? I have no idea. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Gosh, you know, I'm, I'm really, I feel terrible because right now I should, I should know the name of... Uh, we can look it up later. Yeah, please. And then we maybe can, we can we rerun can it, it a little bit. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> he was a great guy to work with, and, and the name is on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Uh, that, well, we can fix that in the transcript. Okay. Um, uh, so you also did video codecs for Eloquent? Yeah, that was interesting. So um, th this is a company based in the Bay Area, right? Um, and they, um, they were doing kind of, I'm, I'm getting all things a little bit mixed up, but they're, they were doing instructional software and needed to have video um, compression and so on. So it turned out that um, Telenor in Norway had a, a video compression uh, system that they had done and we actually could use it. So I decided, that I would go over there and talk to them, see if we could license it. So I actually went over to Norway, I happened to be there anyway, and I went to Telenor and met the guy who'd done this uh, codec, and, uh, and I said, hey, you know, we would really like to license this. And he kind of looks around, and he says, we, we, don't, we don't know how to do that, so uh, we'll just give it to you. So they just gave us this codec and um, we integrated into the Eloquent system. That was pretty surprising. Wow, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty rare. Yeah. <laughs> So no royal, no royalties paid. Or they just handed it over. Wow, <laughs> that was in the day, right? Because they did probably didn't have any mechanism within Telenor to to do any of that at the time. Yeah, wow. Well. Um, so then, in 1999, you started a company called Marketocracy. Marketocracy, right? So. Um, Ken Cam, I had met through friends and so on, and he was a he was a very successful fund manager, and he had done um, a fund that that uh, technology value fund that had done super well. Okay, and so he wanted to move on to the next thing, and and we kind of had the uh, this idea together of of well, what if we could actually take the world's best investors, you know, kind of get them off the net, and Put, pull them together into a team and actually use the combined brilliance of these people and make a fund, right? And so the idea is, you know, you would have a, um, a model fund that you would do yourself. You would actually have to abide by all of the mutual fund rules and you could, you know, buy and sell stocks in real time but with fake money. You know, it would be using the delayed feed so we wouldn't be, you know, uh, having to pay anything for the feed. And then we would rank people's um, people's performance over the over the months and years, and over time, certain people would would end up the the best people, and then we would pull them together and create a fund based on their trades, and we would follow them. We would basically follow their trades and then create this this fund together, and actually, um, it did very well for a while. Um, Ken had. Some, some issues with like how it was trading because doing a lot of trading because they're, you know, you might have had 50 people who are bringing this in and so you have a lot of stocks. And so um, it ended up not being fully automated and then the, the performance suffered a little bit. And we, you know, I, I had brought a number of people into the company and so, you know, it's one of those things that's like, okay, the vision has, has um, diverged, you know, his vision, our vision has diverged and so, you know, we, we went our separate ways. But I thought marketocracy was a really great concept and it was one of the early um, kind of internet uh, kind of crowdfunded or crowd processing systems. And we wrote the whole thing in web objects, which was an Apple thing at the time. 
and so we ran it on little servers, and um, it was really quite interesting. We we learned a lot about what it took to build a, a website and a website that had a back end that did actual work. Uh, it actually turned out to be a lot of compute to bring that all in and deal with real time streams that were going to be writer, you know, right now. And then oh gosh, that that price I gave you, you know, 10 minutes ago was wrong, it should be this, and so you had to go back in and fix everything, and there was a lot of kind of managing kind of errors and the unreliability of the data streams that we're getting in. So it was a real big learning experience for us about dealing with the real world that wasn't perfect. Interesting stuff. Um, why was web objects chosen? I think because, you know, um, Blake Ward and I, who is, you know, one of the guys that I brought in, we were both Apple people. We believed in web objects because web objects was, you know, an object-oriented approach to doing web systems. Uh, it was based on Next, right? Kind of Next thinking, and that was the most advanced thing at the time. And we we believed in it. And we believed in the people who designed it. And actually, I I would have done it, you know, at the same at the time. I would have basically, you know, looking back, made the same decision. Yeah. It was really a good system, actually. Yeah. Really neat to see. Um, so then you worked at Wild Packets after that? Yeah, I was just a consultant. Um, Wild Packets was a, a neat little company doing um, kind of packet um, analysis and kind of system, system management. And one of the things I helped them do is kind of how do you take it to the next level in terms of analysis? How do you look at things in terms of, you know, trends and monitoring and kind of figuring out what what's going on and basically setting alarms. And so I kind of helped them design a little framework. And actually I brought in the idea that, you, you know, why not save a bunch of these packets, you know, as they're coming by and use the database and, and so on. And so um, I kind of brought that, that thinking to them and helped them design that. Uh, Packet, Wild Packers is a nice company, really enjoyed working there, great people. Uh, how did you start getting into um, AI and natural language processing? So, um, you know, I'd been working on iFile, which was doing some rudimentary uh, natural language processing, very rudimentary. Uh, and, of course, it was English only. I'd always been interested in languages and thinking languages were um, kind of an interesting topic of study. And I remember um, I had, was reading um, news and I saw kind of an announcement and look a little interview with Barney Pell, who I'd known kind of through the grapevine, that he had started this company called PowerSet. So I sent a note to Barney. I said, hey, uh, you know, I wish you would call me. I would have loved to join your company. I want to join your company now. So I ended up joining uh, PowerSet, and that was my kind of first uh, introduction to kind of the real world of NLP um, at the time. And so I learned a lot. Um, I, I came in to build tools. Uh, I ended up running a, a chunk of the company. Um, and I learned a lot because we, we had uh, Ron Kaplan was there, Livia Polani were there, the people from Xerox Park and from, um, you know, from places that I knew and I respected. And they, they brought in the Xerox Park technology called XLE, the Xerox Linguistic Environment. And so we had XLE, we had CFSM, which is their finite state system, and I learned a lot about kind of how you model and what, what a natural language pipeline would look like. And that was, um, that was just really interesting. And I also learned a little bit about, about search, right, because it was a, power, a natural language search system, and the people who were real, building that part were um, ex-Yahoo, and so they were extremely um, up on all of that, and, and uh, I learned a bit about search and kind of what, what mattered in search, and learned a lot about what relevance was versus just, you know, can we do natural language search? You know, you still have to get the right answer, or a relevant answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so then uh, PowerSet was acquired by Microsoft in right. 2008. Mm -hmm. So then you continued on and became part of Microsoft. Right, so um, when I, ended up going to, to Microsoft, uh, one of the th things that happened was they looked at us as kind of an aqua hire. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do we make Bing better? And one of the big things that they were having trouble with, Bing was having trouble with, was the search engine result page. You know, after you do the search, 
you have a display. What does that look like? And they were having some trouble with that. So they basically came to us and said, we're taking half your team. So they took half of PowerSet and put them on the problem of making Bing's search engine result page awesome. And so our search team, you know, the people who did the search side of things at PowerSet, um, looked at the code and they, they ended up saying, well, we're going to do a new one. So they rewrote the search engine result page. And so that's where a lot of the kind of the features that you're used to now where you have kind of the structured results about who this person is and the related results and all of these things, that came from, from the PowerSet team. It went to Bing and then brought that to the, to the masses with Bing search engine result page, which was then, I, I think, copied by, by the other search engines. And so I, I think that PowerSet kind of changed the world by going through Bing and, and showing what's possible in terms of what a good search engine result page would look like, a useful one rather than just a set of pages that would, you know, that have potential uh, information that you would want. Right. So you were part of that, that move to the... I, I was part of that move, but I wasn't part of the 30 people that went to the SERP, the SERP page rewrite. Oh, okay. So I stayed with Ron Kaplan and his team, kind of a natural language side. So it was Ron Kaplan and Martin Vandenberg and I think Livia Polani was there. And we were working on kind of how do you get more natural language-ness into Bing. And so I, I mostly just worked with uh, Ron and uh, was working on kind of things like um, summarization and, and kind of natural language projects for, for being on that side. Um, so then uh, you left Microsoft in 20, 2011? Right. And then you joined Intel? Right, I joined Intel. So how did that happen? Well, the funny thing was, is I was, um, I'd gone to another little company in the meantime, uh, trying to help them with their natural language problems, and that didn't turn out. Uh, and I, I was kind of thinking, okay, what's the next place? And I called some of my friends, and I called a, f a friend, Scott Love. And I said, Scott, so I'm thinking about moving on to the next thing. He goes, you should come to Intel. It's super great. We're doing awesome things at Intel now. And I'm going, Intel? They just you know, it's a chip company, right? Well, Scott was right. They were doing a bunch of great things. They had hired Mike Bell, um, who was leading kind of a brand new effort. And uh, they'd, um, they had hired Steve Holmes, also from kind of former Apple and Nike. I ended up working for Steve. And we had a, a group called uh, Smart Device Innovation. And what I wanted to do was bring in um, to Intel kind of end-to-end -end capability in AI so that if we knew what every piece of the AI pipeline looked like we could write software and build chips that would support that to build kind of an AI capability within Intel and the way I decided that that would be best to do is to do a, a personal assistant and I was very interested in kind of the cognitive personal cognitive assistant again going back to way back to Doug Engelbart how do you use computers to make the world a better place to augment human intellect. And I thought a personal cognitive assistant would be the way to go. Well, you know, the way things end up doing, you know, we ended up doing something slightly different. We ended up doing the, the Oakley Radar Pace, which was a running and cycling coach in glasses. And so uh, I hired people. We um, hired some brilliant uh, people for my team. Uh, we did a few acquisitions, put together a team with the right capabilities and competence and passion to do something like this, and we built this product, which was really quite interesting. Um, it had a full conversational interface. It modeled 12 different uh, features of dialogue. Um, we did our own speech recognition system. We licensed a speech, um, our text-to-speech system, and all of that ran on your phone. So it ran locally on the phone. It didn't require an internet connection. And of course, it had a back end on the phone that did the coaching, figured out Know, at what point should it say something? Are you keeping up with what it wants you to do that day on that workout? Um, it was very sophisticated and really quite good. And actually, I used it for a year or so, and it actually got me into running. It was so good. Um, but that was kind of uh, that was Intel's foray into a consumer product with Oakley, and I think Oakley and Intel both chose you know chose to discontinue that because it really wasn't in their main line of business. Oakley didn't really want to have 
uh, computerized glasses and have to deal with a web backend, <laughs> right? That was not their thing. And Intel, you know, again, Intel and it has had challenges with its, compu with its consumer outreach. Um, but it was a great product at the time. I had a lot of fun and, and, and again, hired some brilliant people, people like Jim Furby. Again, Martin Vandenberg, Livia Polanyi were involved in that. So interesting. So this would be, you would wear the Oakley sunglasses, and th they would be basically they would they would be smart sunglasses, right? And they would c be connected to your phone, right? And so you would be running wearing the glasses and in your phone, right? Okay. And you would say, you know, okay, radar, what's my workout today? And it says you're going to run for seven miles and climb 800 feet. And as you're, you know, as you would say start workout, and as you're running, the glasses would be. You know, doing all the sensor fusion, your heart rate, and you know how fast you're running, and had a bunch of sensors in the glasses, and it would decide you know how well you're doing. It might say something like take shorter steps, or you know this is not a sprint workout, slow down, mm. or it would just kind of speak up and say you know, you know it would be quiet for a while, and then it noticed that maybe it was, now's a good time to tell you about your overall goals, and would just start to speak up about well the goal of this workout is blah blah blah, and it would tell you these things. Um, it was very engaging and very natural, and people started to really enjoy um, kind of using this coach that was real time, and it would give you, you know, advice as you're doing your running or cycling. Um, I, I think it's one of the most innovative products I worked on, you know, since the Mac, um, and that that got me very excited about the whole idea of personal cognitive assistance, and I'm still working on that. Yeah, well, I, I think it's also very interesting. Cause I think. Th this this must have fit into like Intel was really big into Internet of Things and quantified self type stuff right. at the time, right? So this is all part of that whole push, right? A part of the whole smart devices, yeah. right? And you know, Steve Holmes was running the smart device group, <clears throat> smart device innovation. So there are a bunch of different little projects that are going on. This was kind of the major project, probably with the most people at the time. Um, Again, you know, when you're focused on one thing, you don't see a whole lot of what else is going on. I did a lot of work uh, with um, with Intel Capital, doing technical due diligence on companies that we might or might not, you know, acquire. And one of the companies I I did bring in was kind of in support of the intelligent cognitive assistance area, a company called Saffron Technology. And we actually ended up using that technology within Intel and doing a lot of cost savings, but it didn't ever get integrated into any of the other systems we, we built. Um, but, but, the, but the system that you worked on actually did become a shipping product. Yeah, it became a shipping wow. product, yeah. In fact, I was you know, overseas when, one year and I was walking through a town and I saw an Oakley store and I walked into the store and said, do you know do you guys have an Oakley Radar Pace? And they said, sure, and let me tell you all about it. So uh, that was pretty neat. And uh, yeah, it sold for a few years, and then, then I, I guess they just stopped selling it. If you search for it, you'll, you'll still land on the um, Oakley site, but it'll say, we don't have that anymore. We, that page doesn't exist. But Maybe we should get one for the museum's collection. Yeah, <laughs> like something yeah it'd be a good thing to have. Pretty interesting. You, um, can, you can still buy them from other places, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and let's see. Um, yeah, that comes pretty close to the present. Um, yeah. So you continue to work on AI systems and personal assistance. Right. Yeah, I'm still very interested in trying to use computers to kind of help the world be better. You know, how do we run simulations to see where the world is going? How can we steer it better? I'm very, very interested in doing what I can uh, about the climate crisis. And anything we can do to allow the scientists to be better scientists, allow individuals to know more about what the truth of the world is, I think is, is worth working on. So I'm still very interested in the whole concept of a uh, personal cognitive assistant and something that can reach a lot more people. I mean, we're gonna have, what, three billion more people on the planet by 2030. And a lot of these people, you know, I think their interface to the world will be a handheld device, might not have a screen, um, but if you have a, a conversational assistant that could, you know, really engage with the person and provide the information they need, that would be, have huge value. 
uh, you know, something inexpensive, but you know, reaching out to the whole internet um, in a way that basically is is meets them, meets them where they are. You know, speaks their language, uh, understands what they're saying, uh, knows about them to the point that, that it can provide proactive assistance. You know, and say, by the way, I noticed that you know the price of such and such has gone down. You might consider, you know, selling your product in this other area. You know, helping people in their everyday world, but also bringing them up in terms of their understanding of the world on a broader scale. Yeah. Um, oh, I forgot to ask. Like, so. Uh, you're no longer at Intel, so you, you left in 2018? Right. Okay. right. And I did a couple of startups in the meantime. Um, one of them was Robust AI. I worked for them a little bit, learned a little bit about um, robots and um, robot planning, and now I'm back at Apple after about four decades, and I'm very happy to be back, back at Apple now. Okay. Um, it, it, the reason you left Intel was simply just because the 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 radar system was discontinued. Is that it was discontinued. Also, um, again, Intel was uh, is one of these companies that they need to shift their focus on a regular basis. At Intel, there are redeployments. People get moved around, or you're you're told your project isn't going to happen anymore, and so you have a certain amount of time to find a new job. At Intel, um, I was in that situation where our our group was basically dissolved and. Um, I basically chose to, to move on and didn't, didn't find anything at Intel that was going to match you know, what I was interested in working on. I loved Intel though, that was another great place to work, again great people. I'm, I'm super happy to have been there for the time I was there um, and you know, I'm grateful for having had that opportunity but at this point uh, I think I'm going to be at Apple for the rest of my career, it's the hope anyway. That's an interesting homecoming. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. So um, you've been in, you know, you've been working in, you know, the computer industry since high school, um, and you've been in on the ground floor of the PC revolution, and and now you're part of, you know, this AI revolution. Um, how has the computer industry changed in the last fifty years, um, and do you think it's changed for the better or for the worse? Well, clearly for the better and for the worse, right? So for the better, I would say the fact that um, computing has become commoditized, everybody has access to amazing computing devices and you know, Macs and PCs that you know, give you leverage, uh, allow you to do things you never were able to do before, so much has changed. Um, so in the sense that computing is everywhere and makes things better for people, that's great. In kind of when that happened, in the shift from kind of research to commodity, which was you know late 90s, maybe, maybe even early 90s, um, that also kind of slowed down innovation. Because when you had a kind of a small group that could move fast, like at Park, innovation happened at this breakneck speed. And you can look at small talk innovation over the years and how that was at breakneck speed. It just changed faster and faster and became more and more capable and could do more things and was more amazing and you could build bigger and more amazing things. And then that kind of stopped as soon as that became kind of out in the world. Um, it became static. Um, it, when you're subject to the vagaries of the market, you're highly constrained as to what you're allowed to do. And a company has to have a certain amount of forward-looking kind of courage to go outside of the mainstream and say, we're going to try something very different, something that might or might not have a financial return. So Alan Kay always said you should basically put 10% of your money into something that you have no idea whether it'll succeed or not. You, should, you just need to invest in that because, you know, 10% of that might turn into something but you have to have no expectations. You have to be able to think big. So I think right now the kind of thinking big is still constrained. You know, everyone's impressed by a lot of the things that are going on in AI, things like DALI and GPT-3. Uh, but again, I think that's all still incremental progress. It's not kind of thinking outside the box of, with a goal toward 
doing something that is great for humanity. It's more like, well, you know, what if we add another, you know, billion parameters to this big language model? What can we do? Or, you know, what if we bring a bunch more data into the system? Or what if we, you know, um, you know, take this per computer and make it 20% faster. That's all great and everything, but it's not invention. It's not a new thing. It's the same thing better. That's what innovation is, but it's not invention, not a new thing. So the question is, what is the new thing? What is the new thing that we're all going to look back, you know, 10 years from now saying, oh, that was inev inevitable, but we don't have any idea what it is right now. So Alan would say, go 10 years out, look back, say, what, what are we going to have in 10 years that we look back and we say, oh, that was inevitable, right? Um, that's where I think we stand now. We need invention. We need kind of people with the, the courage to go after things that they don't really know what the form will be. You know, how will this actually be developed? You know, try things that you have no idea whether they'll succeed. That's interesting that, like, you mentioned that innovation is really just evolutionary rather than invention, which is revolutionary. Right. I don't think I've ever heard it put that. that so way. Alan uh, taught me that. Um, I was watching some of his uh, presentations. And <clears throat> I always thought innovation meant a brand new thing, but no, invention is the brand new thing. And the, the point of yeah, Alan's point, you know, making that distinction is that when you invent something, it's as hard to explain to someone else what that new thing is as it is for you to envision it because you, you have no reference because it's a, it's a brand new thing. There's no reference in your current experience that you can say it's like this thing but different. So it's, it's a very big step both for the inventor and for the inventor to explain it to other people. And that's what makes it hard because it is a a significant leap again against your own background of knowledge. And um, so, you know, you can't really talk about invention just kind of in, in, you know, casual discussion because it takes massive work to get out of your own framework, your own frame of mind, your own frame of reference. How do you get out of that and put yourself in another place that's unfamiliar? That's very typical. Yeah. I mean, that kind of goes back to the, you know, when Steve saw the, the small talk, um, that the fact that he recognized that there was something new there w is kind of a big deal. A huge deal. Because he saw something that other people might not have seen, and, and yet he also missed things, too. Right. 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 He missed a lot because he didn't really, he, he saw what was possible but he didn't see how that was made possible. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at you know, the early uh, Apple operating systems, they were making that thing possible in a completely different way. We didn't have an object-oriented programming language underlying our entire operating system, um, where that's the case in Smalltalk. But we did kind of the surface stuff. You know, We had menus and so on and direct manipulation. So we were able to implement some of those things, but it, because it's kind of a snapshot of reality at the time, it's harder to evolve that thing than if you had a, a complete dynamic system underneath where you could change things very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but invention is going to be very tough because, you know, if you look at all of the um, James Bond movies right now, and you look at the, all of the things from the past, it's like, yeah, we have all that stuff, all that super magic technology. We have it all. So what would a Bond movie of today show us? What would that be? And that's very hard to imagine. So we need the science fiction people, and we need the people who are really futurists to kind of imagine those things for us, and maybe, maybe we can help make some of that reality. Yeah. Um, so where, where do you think um, the next big thing is um, going to be? What, what do you think it's? <laughs> well, I mean, if it's, uh, I, I can't really talk about what I think it'll be because I'm now. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, and um, what I hope it will be is uh, something that will allow um, everybody on the planet to understand our common destiny and to act accordingly, right? We have massive, massive combining and, and merging crises. 
you know, so we have environmental crisis of, um, you know, basically the, the climate crisis is major. We have um, issues with, you know, water and desertification. We have issues with population and um, basically overusing the natural resources of the planet. And we need to pull together and say, you know, this, this planet itself, the thing that brings us life is worth protecting. We need to have the concept of ecocide being something that is understood and real and, and you know, used as a protection against, you know, further degradation of the planet. You know, biological diversity is going down at a tremendous rate. What are the consequences of that? We should basically be able to see in the future and say, if we do these things, this is what life will be like. But everybody needs to be on the same page there. There are a lot of deniers, a lot of people who think, oh, it can't happen in my lifetime, so I don't care. I want to bring the future to everybody now so we can all make the best decisions we can uh, and be on the same page about that. Um, in your view, what has been the significance of the creation of the graphical user interface and you know, the Windows icons menus paradigm? Just direct manipulation uh, and modeless, you know, modeless interaction, um, you know, I think that made it possible for regular people who don't want to talk and code to computers to do real things. I think it absolutely was a, a, um, a seminal event, right? The bringing of the, the graphical user interface to humanity changed everything. And the reason it did that was what the graphical user interface does is it provides common ground. It meets us where we are. We know how to point at things. We know how to give commands to things, do this. Um, it has a lot of context about who we are, right? Um, old, old computers, you know, in the old, old days, the context you would have was whatever the commands you could type at the, at the terminal or even a, a deck of cards. That's not very much of our reality. Whereas a piece of paper on a desk is our reality. Pointing at things is our reality. And um, I, I like to say a click is not just a click. So if you think about a click, the entire meaning of a click is contextual. It's like, where did I click? When did I click? Did I double click? Is it a menu bar? Is it in some text? It's all contextual, but that context is shared with us. It's something we intuitively understand. That's why the graphical user interface made it possible for regular people to learn to use a computer. Um, figuring out what the next more context is, you know, how much more context can we learn and put in the computer to embody, right? Think about language, you know, that now that um, Siri and other personal assistants can understand our language, that's another level of context. You have to get to more and more of what we are as humans to have a better user interface. And I think we're kind of on our way with these conversational assistants. Um, has there been anything um, in your career that we've miss that you would like to add? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think we covered pretty much everything. Uh, it's been an interesting career. It's, it's uh, you know, has ups and downs, but I've been very lucky to have um, the experiences I've had. I would say that um, some of the things I've been passionate about, I'd like to still work on. I still am very much an environmentalist. How can I use computing to help uh, help the world in that way? I think that's really important. I kind of, if I if I, uh, you know, if I retire, maybe I'll work full time uh, on the climate crisis. I don't exactly know, but I, I've uh, I've had a good run so far, and I'm grateful for it all. Thank you. Um, Lastly, what advice would you give to a young person starting in the industry today? I would say just get involved. Get in and do stuff, right? There's no, there's no substitute for doing things and trying things out, um, being fearless. I think being fearless is really important and knowing that failing is not failing. It's just feedback. It's like, okay, that didn't work. What did I learn from that? I think. Being fearless and realizing that failure is not a bad thing. 
that's my, that's my advice. I think just go with your passions. Um, make sure that you work with other people and learn, with other, learn from other people. I think having mentors is really important. They can skip a lot of learning uh, by the you know, hard knocks if you have the right mentors. But uh, I think just get, dive in, do stuff, make things happen, and be aware of other opportunities as they occur. You know, sometimes if you have your head down all the time, you don't see other things happening. So every once in a while, look up and say, okay, what's happening out in the world? Is there something that I should be aware of? So um, I know I, I did a lot of heads down for many, many years. Probably okay at the time, but there might have been other things I could have done if I had looked up. Thank you very much. My pleasure.